Ellen Singer, whom we met through Carol Ann Benton, um, spoke to us last time about critical race theory or what people think is critical race theory, and he's going to deepen that discussion tonight. I, as I said in my write-up, I really appreciate that because it's coming to Westchester. It's come to Westchester with right, right wing efforts to influence school boards and libraries. So, um, okay. So, Alan, Professor Alan J. Singer of Hofstra, please go for it. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I was, uh, Julie and I were just talking. I had said the title would be the 1626 Project, and she corrected it to the 1619 Project. So it really is the 1626 Project. I'm going to open the PowerPoint, and I'll explain why. All right. All right, it's like Oh, wow, look at that. Okay, you should now be able to, to see this. I, I put this presentation together with a colleague, Cynthia Copeland of, of NYU. And uh, so this is, I, I, we actually, presented a couple of weeks ago at the, for the New York Development uh, Corporation, their Black History Month activity. Yeah. Um, you could boo, that's Ron DeSantis and uh, the author of the Stop Woke Act, which is what we're all worried about. Uh, and that he's the governor of Florida and he's been attacking critical race theory and this is the thing, what I'm going to be presenting tonight, it's not critical race theory. It's just good history. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this is Black History Month, but what I'm going to be talking about isn't Black history. This is American history. And I think that's key. Now, I argue that race and racism at, are at the core of American history. And what I'd like to do is try to illustrate some of that tonight. The, that's, I, I call it this the 1626 project. It was the first enslaved Africans were brought to New Amsterdam in 1626. Um, this is a, a woodcut from 1655 of New Amsterdam and it shows a Dutch uh, farmer and his wife. And if you look behind them, you see enslaved Africans carrying material up from the harbor to the heights. And then in the distance, you can see a village. <clears throat> Anybody want to guess where this image is uh, portraying? People, yeah. enslaved Africans are bringing goods up to the heights. And in the distance, we see a small village. And New York City? New York. Okay, it's New York City in the background, but what's the heights that they're standing on? Phillips Manor. No, this would be the <laughs> promenade, the Brooklyn promenade. Mm -hmm. It's Brooklyn Heights. <clears throat> now, the name Brooklyn is originally, it's a Dutch uh, name, and it doesn't mean brook. It actually means brook or broken. And they called Brooklyn broken land, Brooklyn, because it was hilly across from the harbor. But again, enslaved Africans are brought to the city 1626. The original enslaved Africans, all men, uh, they had Portuguese names, which suggests that the Dutch probably purchased them off a Portuguese ship or else the, a Dutch ship attacked the Portuguese ship and captured its cargo. Women were brought the next year. Now, one of the things that I focus on as a teacher, and that this is directly related to the attack on critical race theory, who should we commemorate? On, on the left here, you see a statue from New York Central Park. 
And that's uh, Samuel Morris, and he's got his hand on the uh, telegraph, and uh, he invented the Morse code, and he's honored with a statue at 72nd Street in the park in its inventor's row. Now, Morse is, uh, was also a founder and the first president of the National Academy of Design, and he, its office is directly across from that area of the park. So should someone like Samuel Morse be honored with a statue in New York Central Park? Well, Morse was actually a major advocate of slavery. In his journal, he wrote, slavery is not sin. It's a social condition ordained from the beginning of the world for the wisest purposes, benevolent and disciplinary by divine wisdom. Morse not only believed that slavery was ordered by God, but he was an advocate of slavery. He was an opponent of uh, the Civil War and the, end, and the end of enslavement. So one of the questions comes, do we continue to honor someone like this when we know who he really was? Peter Stuyvesant was the director <clears throat> general of the Dutch New Netherlands colony. That's his statue at Stuyvesant Square, which was uh, originally his farmland. Now, as, as director general, he was responsible for construction of Wall Street. He was also the largest private slaveholder in the Dutch colony and a virulent anti-Semite who petitioned the Dutch West Indies Company to prevent Jews from settling there. You know, is this someone we should be honoring? This is Stuyvesant High School, named after Peter Stuyvesant, a racist and an anti-Semite and a slaveholder. But a lot of this has just been erased from history. Question is, how do we bring it back? Now, this is a new one. Some of you may be familiar with McCombs Road. It runs, it starts about near Yankee Stadium. Um, actually, I think it hit about 172nd Street in Jerome. It then runs up to University in Tremont. I guess you guys don't know the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, Alexander McComb, who McCombs Road is named after, and McCombs Dam Park is named after, and McCombs Dam Bridge is named after, was the third largest slaveholder in the city of New York in 1790. His son, also named Alexander, was responsible for genocide against the Seminole in Florida. And in the Bronx, on McCombs Road, University Avenue, IS-232 is the Alexander McComb School. At what point do we begin to recognize who the Alexander McComb father and son were. Well, this is what I call the 1626 project. This is why uh, they called it the 1619 project. So at what point do we start to recognize uh, the real history of the United States? Now, it, I don't know, you know, Cardi B, is a graduate of that school and she gave $100,000 to her alma mater. She's the second most famous graduate of McCombs Junior High School. I, the first one was me <laughs> uh, in 1964. <laughs> I think Cardi graduated a lot more recently. Now, James Marion Sims, his statue was located in Central Park at 103rd Street. He was honored as a pioneer of modern medicine and gynecology. He helped to establish the Women's Hospital, which is now part of Mount Sinai, and the Cancer Hospital, which is now part of Sloan Kettering. His statue was removed in 2018. Why? Well, between 1845 and 1849, Sims performed experimental gynecological operation on enslaved African women in American South, including over 34 operations on one woman without benefit anesthesia or any antiseptic. 
Many of the women he experimented on lost their lives to infection. This was a Harlem youth group that demonstrated in front of the statue in hospital gowns drenched in red paint. Uh, Sims is buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. His statue is now in storage in Brooklyn while they're trying to figure out what to do with it. This is the 1626 project. Now, one of the things interesting about Sims, Sims conducted his experiment in Alabama. If you go to the Alabama State House in Montgomery, Alabama, there are two large statues right in front of the entrance. One of them is James Marion Sims. The other is Jefferson Davis. Now the New York Times 1619 project challenged the idea that slavery was peripheral to American economic, social, and political development and argued it was central. It played the same role in New York City, though we don't tend to think of New York City as having slavery in the same way. However, there was enslavement in the city and state up into 1827. This is the African burial ground. Now the burial, under the Dutch, the, out, the northern limit of the village was Wall Street, why there was the wall. Under the British, the northern limit of the town was Chamber Street. They had their wall. This is Reed, one block north of Chambers, because enslaved Africans were not allowed to be buried in the churchyards of the New York village. Uh, they, had, they attended church, segregated balconies in the village, but they could not be buried in sacred ground. Uh, yes, there may have been between 5,000 and 10,000 enslaved Africans and free Africans buried in these grounds. These mounds each contain the rem remains of about 5,000 people whose bones, I'm sorry, 500 people whose bones were discovered when they were building the foundation for a new federal office building in 1991. Now, that burial ground is on old maps of New York, but it was completely written out of history along with the history of New York's enslaved Blacks. This is a Trinity Church. Now, this is actually the third building of Trinity Church on that site. Uh, the original church is built in the 1690s, and we know from the church's record that it was built, the original building was built by enslaved Africans who were, their labor was donated by their slave holders. Uh, one of the more prominent New Yorkers buried in this uh, church is Alexander Hamilton and his wife, Eliza. Now, if you uh, saw the play, Alexander and Eliza were not black and Latino. As a matter of fact, Eliza's father, as a wedding present, gave them enslaved African girls as servants. Now, one of the things that the, the play got wrong, and I, I love the play, you know, it castigates Aaron Burr and it uh, presents Alexander as a hero. I'm going to get my shot. I'm going to get my shot. And the bird says, I can't believe that I'm the one who killed Alexander Hamilton. In the 1780s, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, and John Jay, who becomes governor of New York, who was actually the first chief justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, they found the New York Manumission Society to end slavery. But this is the interesting thing. Hamilton and Jay, who were both slaveholders, they believed in gradual emancipation. Well, what did that mean? Well, it meant that the enslaved Africans would have to work for free as slaves 
for a set amount of time to reimburse their owners for the cost of freeing them. I mean, they had to pay, work off their own freedom. Aaron Burr, however, he believed in immediate emancipation. It was Hamilton and Jay who wanted gradual emancipation. Now, Burr and Jay eventually got the Gradual Emancipation Act passed by the state of New York, 1799. They couldn't get, Burr could not get immediate emancipation through. But with gradual emancipation, anybody born enslaved before 1800 had to work for 27 years to pay his owner for his freedom. Now, this is St. Paul's Chapel, where George Washington prayed when he was a president in original in New York. Uh, the original uh, Trinity got burned down during the revolution. That, that's why they prayed at the chapel. And the chapel had segregated sections for the black servants. And they could not be buried. They could be parishioners, but they could not be buried in the churchyard. St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, this is a, an 1857 drawing that was on the estate of Peter Stuyvesant. This was, it was a, a slave holding estate up until the end of slavery in New York in 1827. And this is Seneca Village. After uh, slavery ended in New York 1827, a lot of free Blacks migrate up Manhattan Island into the area in between about the what's now the 70s and the 90s. And in what is now Central Park along 8th Avenue, they built their own community and it was called Seneca Village. In 1857, New York decided to confiscate the land and take it away from the villagers who lived there to build Central Park. The park actually is not built till after the Civil War, but the plans were made in the 1850s. The enslaved Africans, now free black men and women who lived in Seneca Village, were not able to document that they were the owners of the land. So they were just evicted and their community was destroyed and buried over. It is basically, it's been found, it's across the street from Museum of Natural History. The history of enslavement and its role in New York has largely been erased from history. But this is the thing. This history was known to ordinary Americans. This is a woodcut from Harper's New Monthly Magazine, January 1895. It's been, uh, it's been colorized. This shows the corner of Wall Street and Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan, where New York in 1711 established the slave market, where newly arrived Africans, mostly from the Caribbean, would be sold, and that people who were already here could be rented out. Now, this is from the article in Harper's New Monthly Magazine, which was addressed to an ordinary working class literate audience. From the very foundation of the New Netherlands colony, slavery was part and parcel of its economic organization because a colonial establishment of that period to be well equipped required slaves in just the same way it required horses and cows. Enslaved Africans cleared the forest land, they built the fortifications, they dredged the harbor, 
they built the roads. And then they were buried in the burial ground outside the city limits. And then in 1790, as the city expanded, they just plowed right over them. Now, New York was a center for abolition, but it was also a center to defend slavery and the slave trade. Samuel J. May was a leading abolitionist. 1835, he uh, described an event that happened and it was published in his book, 1869. Now, 1835, abolitionists, black and white, were meeting at a church on Houston Street to uh, develop a campaign to fight against slavery but also to defend freedom seekers who had escaped the city of New York. There was a riot in the city and black and white abolitionists were attacked in the street. The Tappan brothers, who were two of the leading abolitionists, they had a, uh, they were silk merchants with offices on Hanover Street and Water Street, Manhattan. Uh, they had a barricade into their offices because they were attacked by anti-abolitionist mobs. May, in the memoir, writes, I gave her the rice cake. How do you do this there? What? Put more water in it? I think someone just got unmuted. <laughs> there are millions upon millions of dollars due from Southerners to the merchants and mechanics of this city alone the payment of which would be jeopardized by any rupture between the North and South. We cannot afford, sir, to let you and your associates succeed in your endeavor to overthrow slavery. It's not a matter of principle with us, it's a matter of business necessity. May describes how he was approached in the church at the abolitionist meeting by a prominent local businessman who he did not name, who explained why they supported slavery in the South. Now, a lot of what happens in New York's role in slavery was actually um, documented by a slave trader named James Smith. Now, Smith, in 1808, it was illegal for uh, Americans to be involved in the transatlantic slave trade. 1820, it was made a capital offense. Oh. Smith was arrested for being a slave trader. He faced a capital offense, 1854. Smith is not an American citizen. So he does not face the extreme penalty. In the end, he was convicted and sentenced to two years in jail, and he served one. He was so pissed that he was arrested that he testified against all the other slave traders. This is from his testimony. New York is the chief port in the world for the slave trade. It is the greatest place in the universe for it, neither in Cuba, not in the Brazils, it is carried on so extensively. Ships that convey slaves to the West Indies and South America are fitted out in New York. Now and then one sails from Boston to Philadelphia, but New York is our headquarters. Their headquarters were at the South Street Seaport that has no marker explaining its role in the transatlantic slave trade. The ships would be built and outfitted in New York. They would travel to Africa. They would bring back enslaved Africans, generally into Cuba. They would load up with sugar and bring it up to New York where it would be processed. Smith reported that the ship cost $13,000 to fit her out completely. The cargo, the enslaved Africans that he brought to Cuba were worth $220,000 or basically $4.4 million today. 
So for the court for two hundred thousand dollars, he made four point four million. The trade was so lucrative that it was carried out illegally from its offices in the city of New York. This is a, a, a ship at South Street Seaport. That's not a slave ship. This dates from the 1880s, but it gives you a sense of what the ships look like. Uh, this is the corner of Fulton and South Street. And this building, which dates back to the 1810s, that was the building where the headquarters for the slave trade was on the second floor in a restaurant called Sweets. And again, it's all identified in his testimony by James Smith. There, today it's a uh, Heartland Brewery, no designation of its historical significance. This is an article also from Harper's Weekly, June 2nd, 1860. This is, um, what, six months before the start of the Civil War. On the morning of the 30th of April last, the United States steamer Mohawk, Lieutenant Craven commanding, came to anchor in the harbor of this place, New York, having in tow a bark of the burden of about 330 tons, supposed to be the bark wildfire, lately owned in the city of New York. The bark had on board 510 natives, Africans, taken on board the River Congo on the west side of the continent of Africa. This is one of the ships sailing out of South Street Seaport. And this is the drawing of the Africans congested on deck. Now, New York also had anti-slavery heroes. And these are some of my favorites, but you can have others. Arthur and Lewis Tappan are white men. They're silk merchants. They organized the defense of the Amistad captives in 1839. And they flooded the South with anti-slavery literature. They just mailed it, mass mailings. And in South Carolina, they were wanted dead or alive. David Ruggles was an African-American. He was the organizer of the New York Vigilance Committee. And what they did is they would go down to the docks and they would see people who likely were runaways and they would help them on the Underground Railroad on their voyage out of the city. New York City was a key location on the Underground Railroad. Uh, People could escape to Philadelphia, which was the core. And then they would could go by carriage or by train or by boat or by foot. And they end up in Brooklyn or Manhattan. They would be hidden here in places like uh, Plymouth Church until it was safe to move out. And then from New York, you can either go up the Hudson River and then when you got to Albany, you made a left on the Erie Canal, or you went straight up to Lake Champlain into Canada. Or you could get a boat up Long Island Sound to Massachusetts. Ruggles helped Frederick Douglass to escape to freedom. Douglass took the boat route and ended up in uh, New Britain, Massachusetts, where he met William Lloyd Garrison. Henry Highland Garnett was also an African-American abolitionist. Ruggles had been born free in Connecticut. Garnett was born enslaved. His parents escaped from Maryland, ended up in New Jersey, and then fled across New Jersey, ending up in Brooklyn. Uh, Garnett's family was broken up when he was a teenager. He had to be smuggled out of Brooklyn, out onto Long Island. He ended up in Smithtown where he was protected by Quakers. 
he became the most radical abolitionist speaker. He becomes a minister of Chilo Church in um, what's now Soho. Church is not there anymore. And in one of his speeches, he called for armed resistance. Resistance, resistance, resistance. John Jay's son also becomes an important abolitionist. Remember, Jay had been the while well, he did family own slaves in Westchester, uh, Jay was the <clears throat> governor of New York who finally, with Aaron Burr, got through the Gradual Emancipation Act. His son becomes a lawyer. And in the 1850s, he provides pro bono defense <clears throat> for enslaved Africans fleeing the fugitive slave law. So again, we need to learn about the oppression. We need to learn about the complicity, but we also need to learn about resistance. Resistance, resistance. Again, Burr, Hamilton, Jay were founders of Magnificent Society. Burr supported immediate emancipation. That's Burr on top, Hamilton, Jay for gradual. The, we now believe that Aaron Barr had two families. He had a white woman who he had children with, and he had a black woman who he had children with. And that was why he supported uh, immediate emancipation. Unlike Thomas Jefferson, who did not free his own children until his will when he died. These are some of the more prominent villains in the history of New York. Mayors William Havemeyer and Fernando Wood, banker Moses Taylor, and Roman Catholic Archbishop John Hughes. Havemeyer um, inherited Havemeyer's sugar, which on the Brooklyn waterfront becomes domino sugar. Now, this is the thing sugarcane does not grow in Brooklyn, it grows in the Caribbean. In the United States, it grew in Florida and Louisiana. Well, why is the processing going on in the city of New York at Havemeyer's uh, property? Well, what happens is a result of geography and the Gulf Stream. Sugar cane is loaded on coastal vessels in the Caribbean that then follow the coastline up to the port of New York, where it's processed and then put on ocean going vessels and shipped to Europe. So the vessels all follow the Gulf Stream. So what happens to the profits that the Havemeyer family make based on sugar, based on the sale of slave produced commodities? Oh, they have their own bank. They also in invest in and build the Pennsylvania and Long Island Railroad systems with the profits from the sugar. And they open up coal mines in Pennsylvania, employing child labor, white child labor, to supply their railroads with coal. The infrastructure, the railroads that serve the city of New York are built with the profits from slave produce commodities. Havemeyer serves three terms as mayor of New York City. Although the transatlantic slave trade is illegal, with New York City ships and financing, most of the Africans are being smuggled into Cuba. And that becomes very important. The Sugar industry had been based in Haiti, but in 1793, Haitian enslaved Africans rise up and secure their freedom. Uh, because of this, France, England, and the United States, worried about slave rebellions, basically seal Haiti off from the global markets. Haiti can't sell sugar. It's left impoverished. Well, the industry shifts to Cuba. 
But the problem is Cuba does not have a large enslaved African population. So although the slave trade is illegal, slaves are being, Africans are being smuggled into Cuba to satisfy the needs of the planters. This is a former Jamaican plantation. Um, I, I have, I, it's, I've been to Cuba, but I couldn't get to the plantations there and I haven't been to Haiti, but it was easier to, to visit a sugar plantation in Jamaica. Now, sugar, once it ripes, has about two weeks it has to be harvested. You don't harvest it within two weeks, it just rots. So what would happen on the plantations is when the sugar ripe came ripen, they would work 24 seven, all night long, 90 degrees temperature, 90 degrees humidity, cutting the cane. People are working barefoot and with machetes. If you cut yourself, either on a stalk or a machete, you're infected and you die. The life expectancies in the sugar plantations, feeding the profits of New York City merchants is about seven years. Moses Taylor is a merchant and banker. His office was at Wall Street and South Street near the Broken Bridge. The bridge wasn't there. I just have the bridge so you can see where I'm looking at. Taylor was the chief financier of the slave trade into Cuba. Taylor's bank lent money to the planters in Cuba so they could buy seed, they could buy tools, and they could purchase Africans. Basically, they grew it on credit. Taylor then marketed their sugar through New York. Taylor ran a full service bank. He arranged to get supplies. He arranged to have their families and their children taken care of in New York Harvard schools. Moses Taylor. Um, that building that looks like a, you see the glass? Yep, this is the third building from the left. Looks like it's got a glass front with vertical lines. That building is on the site where Moses Taylor's bank was in the 1830s. And this is the thing. From 1830s to today, banks died, came and got their runs on the banks, collapses of the banks. But Moses Taylor's bank survived. That building is still a building of his bank. That's the bank that financed the transatlantic slave trade illegally into the port of New York. And it has this, they didn't want to give up the property. They're still there. Another villain is Archbishop John Hughes. Hughes is an immigrant. Um, he helps to set up the first Catholic archdiocese in New York in 1850. 53 and 54, he travels to Cuba in the American South, where he's a guest of a number of plantations and he witnessed the slave system firsthand. Now, Hughes's sister is married to a, ref, a white refugee planter from Haiti. And so Hughes gets a lot of his opinions about slavery and Africans from his brother-in-law. And then in May 54, Hughes delivered a sermon at the old St. Patrick's in what is now Soho, where he discussed his experience during his trip to the American South in Cuba. In his sermon, now this is reported in the New York Times, Hughes claims to recognize slavery is an evil, 
but he declared it was not an absolute and unmitigated evil because it brought Africans to Christianity. In addition, Hughes believed conditions for Africa were actually improved by enslavement. And he claimed that during his trip, he had taken pains to inquire of some who had been brought to Cuba as slaves on the coast of Africa, whether they wished to return. And they verbally stated they did not. And the reason is that their conditions here, degraded as it is, is much better than it was at home. Now, I find this a little bit confusing to me because Hughes didn't speak Spanish. But on the other hand, neither did the enslaved Africans who had been brought from Africa. So it's not clear to me how Hughes had that conversation with people on the plantations in Cuba. Hughes concluded it is really a mitigation of their lot to be sold into foreign bondage, even of the slavers in snatching them from the butcheries of their native land. Now, the only Africans I can imagine Hughes would have any contact with would have been health servants who might have spoken Spanish, but whose testimony would have been translated to Hughes by their masters and who one knew if they said anything else, they would have been sent out to the sugar fields. Hughes probably didn't get it. That's his statue at Fordham University in the Bronx. But this is the worst villain of them all. New York City Mayor Fernando Ward. The South begins to secede in December, 1860. Uh, two, a month after the election of Abraham Lincoln. Wood gives the state of the city address to the city common council, January 1861. Again, the text is reported in the New York Times. What does Wood call for? Quote, it would seem that a dissolution of the federal union is inevitable with our grieved brethren of the slave states, we have friendly relations and a common sympathy. When disunion has become a fixed and certain fact, why may not New Yorkers disrupt the bands which bind her to a corrupt and venal master? New York as a free city may shed the only light and hope for a future reconstruction of our once blessed Confederacy. Woods had the chutzpah to call for New York City to secede from the Union along with the South. Now, Wood return, gets elected to Congress in 1864. And in Congress, he opposed the 13th Amendment ending slavery. Because if we freed the slaves, how could the South repay its Northern creditors? And this is probably the blackest mark against the city of New York, the 1863 draft riot. Now, the riot was set off because the federal government instituted a draft in July of 1863. It was very poorly timed. The draft took lottery took place the week after the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, during the Civil War, uh, battalions were organized by town, village, and neighborhood. So the Irish Brigade was all drawn out of Manhattan. The Irish Brigade suffered 80% casualties, wounded in death at the Battle of Gettysburg. 
The casualty reports arrived in New York just before the draft. Every Irish working class family lost a son, lost a brother, lost a father, lost a husband. When the draft was announced, the Irish riot in the streets. Police and troops protect the upper class neighborhoods. They open fire on the rioters who then turn on the city's black population and people were lynched in the streets. The rioters burned the college orphan asylum in anger. But again, they burned it after the police opened fire and after they were redirected by the police and troops. Now, the Times has a report on the burning of the uh, asylum. One of the ironies, strangest things, is most of the, the attack was done by women and children. And before they looted it, before they burned it, they looted it, stealing food, clothes, and bedding. It's the upset, it's understandable. The targeting of a black population represents the racism deeply embedded in the city. Um, this is a, a map of Lower Manhattan. I do used to do a walking tour. I, I had to cut it. I'm getting a little old. But this is the city at the time of the American Revolution, pretty much. Northern boundary is Chamber Street. You see, number one, the start, 1741. 35 enslaved Africans are burned and hung to death at Foley Square. Suspected of plotting a rebellion, and there was no evidence. It was a witch trial. Number two is the burial ground. Three is City Hall. Four, that's the chapel. Uh, five, I'm sorry. Sorry, six is the, oh, five is the site of an actual slave rebellion in 1712. Six is the slave market, seven is South Street Seaport, and eight is the African Free School. That area encompasses the Black New York. One of the things that's funny, You'll notice how Water Street is two blocks inland. Well, in 1800, Water Street was the waterfront. Everything to the right of Water Street is landfill. The same, if you look at uh, Trinity Place, Broadway, everything to the left of Trinity Place is also landfill. The entire World Trade Center was landfill. One of the things we did with the walking tour is we trained high school kids to be the docents for the for middle school kids and to um, run teach middle school kids about what they had learned about slavery in the war. And Union Square Academy for Health Sciences, their school participated. They actually created a Google Maps tour of Lower Manhattan slavery sites. Um, I got one last thing I have to do. And then I'm done. Let me just stop screen share.
Oh, I can't find it. Where did I do it? Almost, ah, there it goes. Now in Brooklyn, uh-oh, I just lost it. Oh, come on. I just lost what I wanted to do. I'm not gonna be able to. Wait, oh, ah, I just found it. One last thing I got to In Brooklyn, where I used to be a high school teacher, okay, the okay. kids knew me as the rapper Reese's Pieces. And the kids call me Reese's Pieces because I'm better than Eminem. <laughs> better than what? So I'm going to end it as my alter ego. <laughs> I'm Reese's Pieces PhD. We need to talk about slavery. It's time to tell the truth. Local history, New York was the land of slavery. Dredged the harbor, cleared the land, unloaded ships to make the city grand. 1860 was time for war. But New York's mayor wanted to withdraw. See the elders, they backed the South. They wanted cotton, they had no doubts. City banker and ATT were all involved in complicity. But freedom fighters stood their ground. Through the centuries echoes their sound. New York City wasn't free. Abolition and complicity. The erased past cannot hide. Slavery's history was genocide. Thank you. It's Reese's Pieces. <laughs> wow. All right. Uh, Julie, I'm turning it back to you. <laughs> okay. I'm looking for, oh, okay. Um, well, thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> we have about seven minutes left. We try to stop at seven. And I have a question, but I, if anybody else does, please either write it in the chat or raise your hand electronically. Ask yours. I'm going to ask my questions. Go ahead. It's, it's a what we can do question about the suppression of this history and specifically what I'm concerned about is the efforts to suppress this history in Westchester County. So that's the smaller question. And the bigger question is how do we, I mean, you're doing a good job of countering it. You're educating us and students. And I that's see- That's the what, answer. Um, the answer is to, um, is to tell the truth and is to support teachers who tell the truth. When te teachers are, are being intimidated, you have to go to school board meetings and you have to say, wait a minute, what this teacher did, that's absolutely the state curriculum. That's what they're supposed to teach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. You, we need to be politically involved so that uh, people are not afraid to, to teach the truth. Now, in the chat, someone asked, um, how long did it take Frederick Douglass to get to Rochester? And that, that's an interesting question. First of all, Douglass has two S's. Very important. <laughs> um, I cut it down. Okay. I Frederick, cut it down. Okay, it's okay. Frederick Douglass takes a roundabout what happens is he meets um, Garrison about 1840, and he begins to uh, speak up at church meetings. 
He publishes his book in 1845, but he has to flee the country because once he is known, he's a runaway slave. He could be kidnapped and yes. sold down right. south. He goes to England and in England, he continues, he sells the book, he gives speeches and the British Quakers actually purchase his freedom so he can return to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, Garrison is based in Boston. Mm -hmm. Douglas decides to go up the Erie Canal to Rochester. The rise in Rochester, I think about 1847. And uh, at that point, he, he runs an underground railroad safe house and he, uh, he edit, publishes his newspaper. And yeah. what he would do is he would travel to church groups speaking. And uh, when he speaks at the church groups, uh, he gets sells subscriptions. He sells his book and he sells subscriptions to newspaper, which is how he supported himself. I think the earliest picture of Douglas is in 1851 at Casanova, New York, where he had been participating in the abolitionist rally. Uh, Colleen? Uh, yes, I wasn't quite clear what, what, when you said that um, you would <clears throat> start at 1626 versus 1619, which is when Nicole okay. Anna Jones said the, the white lion landed at Port Comfort. Okay, 1619 was when the first enslaved Africans was brought by the Dutch to Jamestown. Right. Okay, they were the first enslaved Africans in the British colonies uh, of North America. Um, New York is a Dutch colony at, at, up until 1664. 1626 is the year that the first enslaved Africans are brought to the Dutch colony that becomes New York. Oh, okay. That's right. what I'm focusing on local history. Oh, okay, all right, now, thank you. <laughs> something I left out, I have to incorporate in, we all know New York is named after the Duke of York. The Duke of York was the head of the British Royal African Company, which was in charge of the British transatlantic slave trade. And then he later becomes a King of England. <clears throat> New York is named after the largest slave trader ever. Mm. Mm. I'm not saying we should change the name in New York, but I think there needs to be some awareness of that. Um, we have one more question in the chat. And then... yeah, Jeff, is it possible to use the statues? I'm sorry, without honoring the people. Okay, that's it. I, I have, I'm torn. Um, I would like to see statues of George Washington. So there should be some recognition of what they achieved but also recognition of what they did. I think both. I don't think we should tear down the statues of Washington and Jefferson. Uh, at Hofstra, Jefferson had his statue was moved from the a position of prominence at the student center to the Hofstra Museum. And I thought I was on the committee and I thought that was legitimate. Uh, I think they need, I, I think some of the stuff named after Peter Stuyvesant should be changed. But that should be a public debate. There should be public discussion of whether Stuyvesant and High School should be renamed. There should be public discussion of whether streets and villages named after him should be renamed. I, I don't see why we have to honor Peter Stuyvesant uh, anymore. But again, uh, it promised, uh, the, the statue of uh, Teddy Roosevelt was moved from the front of the Museum of Natural History because it was racist and imperialist. And it's now inside the museum as an exhibit that discusses the history of the statue. That's what I would like to see. I'd like to see that discussion. And I think that's what the 1619 project was really about. It was about having that discussion, the discussion we're having here. Uh, Peter. Hi, Professor, I wanna thank you, that was a great uh information um i'm i'm uh, migrated here from jamaica at five years old 
And I remember when I went to school, pre-K and kindergarten, they were telling us like Peter Stuyvesant was some sort of hero. So I thank you for clarifying a lot of the information um, that we had then, uh, we were taught then that may be ingrained in our minds. And I think it is important to get this education out to help maybe some of the adults that don't know a lot of this history. That's important. I think it's also important because slavery didn't start uh, American, Black American history. Uh, I think they need to start thinking about where they came from also. So maybe build some more pride in themselves because a lot of the history, it's so depressing. You know, I mean, we need to know and we need to accept it and recognize it and all these things, how wealth was built and the economy was built off of it. But we need to build pride too because a lot of the crime and issues we have. I think people are just oppressed. It's part of mental health. Um, and I hope that we do get it in the curriculum in Westchester County and in, and in other states. It's much needed because I remember as a child, it was very hard for me because there was, you know, the um, inferiority complex as a youth. You were taught that. Mm -hmm. You didn't feel equal. You mm -hmm. know, and a lot of it was historical. And even though we grow, it's still in us, I feel like as adult and it's still permeating in different areas in education and society. So this history is very important and I thank you so much. It is part of finding a solution. So thank you for that. that that's one of the reasons I focused on people like Henry Island Garnett and David Ruggles who are leaders in the fight for freedom. But the other thing is Peter's point is very well taken. Uh, the best description of the transatlantic slave trade was written by um, Equiano Odalo, who was an Igbo who was captured as a 10-year-old and sold into slavery. Uh, his memoir, not only does he discuss the transatlantic slave trade, but he actually opens with his memories of uh, African civilization, where he lived and the families and the structures. One of the things I've tried to do is to incorporate into the curriculum is Equiano's discussion of Africa. It's the best firsthand account of what African civilizations were like, for, written by an African prior to the transatlantic slave trade. And now I put my email in the chat. If you email me, I'll do two things. I'll put you on my updates list, and I will send you the PowerPoint and I'll send you uh, my slavery curriculum. Alan, uh, we, could we you saw. put it in the chat? I, sorry, I don't see it in the chat, your email. I, I, yes. I, I, yeah, oh, yeah, I see it. Thank you. Yeah, I see it. Now. Okay. Now, if you're already getting my updates, when you email me to get the PowerPoint, tell me you're already getting the updates so I don't put you on the list again. But, uh, Thank you for having me. We we I forgot to ask you because uh, I think you said yes last time whether we could record this. Yeah, that's fine. We did, and that's going to go out to everybody. So that's really if you send all me the, the link to the recording too. Pardon me. Send me the link to the recording as well. I will, um, and it's it will have your PowerPoint, of course, because that was. Um, but also, could you uh, put the name of the book that you just said into the chat, please? Okay. I'll include the chat. All right. Ron will include the chat when he sends out the, uh, or sends me for me to send out <laughs> the um, uh, recording. I must go, but I must thank you also. It was, not only mind-boggling, so much that I didn't know, but you presented it so well. I thank, thank you. you for that. Glad you were here, Ruth. Yeah. Okay. I, I just put, it's two different books I've written about it, and I just put the titles there. They're both from SUNY Press. Okay, we got okay. it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go eat supper. Bye, everyone. Thank you, thank you, you very me, much. And thank I'll you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Carol. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. <laughs>